without further ado, uh, bienvenidos. Welcome again to our um, this really special panel, something that is really close to my heart, something I'm really passionate about on health equity, particularly for the Latina community. Um, and we have three wonderful speakers, Jamie, uh, Dr. Jamie Fernandez, um, Javelin Castellanos, and Estefano Leitner, who have a wealth of experience in the field of uh, health equity. Can't wait to hear um, their experiences and perspectives on this topic. And so I'll let each one of them maybe just kind of uh, go around and do a quick um, introduction to themselves, maybe a high-level summary of the company or organization that they're representing and they work with. Uh, and just really quickly, like in your own words, how do you define health equity? And if we can get um, started for that. So I'll go based on the order that you joined in and I saw you first. So Jamie, maybe you can get us, get us going. Perfect. Thank you, Marvin, for that introduction. And hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Dr. Jamie Fernandez. I am a family medicine doctor at Harbor UCLA. I, Harbor UCLA is part of the Department of Health in LA County, and we serve over 800,000 low-income, mainly black or brown communities here in Los Angeles, insured and uninsured. I also serve as a digital health equity lead at my family medicine program. This is the first time that we've had this position, but it's really come out from a position of need. Um, our population about in all around DHS, only 48% are connected to the wellness portal, which we think is a huge disadvantage for our patients accessing care. Um, I'm currently working on a project that's looking at the composition of the portal. And we realized when I send a message to my Spanish speaking patient, the message on the other side comes out in English, even if their phone is in Spanish. So this is some, the, these kind of accessibility issues are the types of things that are keeping our patients from really accessing care and communicating with me. And I'm working with residents and training new medical students and pre-health students to be aware of these issues and really bringing those conversations to our IT department so we can do something about it. And I will kick off the introductions to Stefano. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for having me be here and for the time. My name is uh, Dr. Stefano Leitner. I'm originally from Miami, Florida, now living in San Francisco, California. I'm a board certified occupational and environmental medicine physician with a subspecialty in something called clinical informatics. What do those words mean? Um, occupational and environmental medicine is a specialty focusing on, on two main areas. The first one is work related injury and disease. That's the occupational aspect. And, um, you know, that's a focus on um, examples could be agricultural workers, people working in airports, postal services. These are jobs that are intensive and they um, can have injuries and diseases. How do we prevent those? Or if they slip through the cracks of prevention, how can we bring them back to work effectively? Um, and the other aspect is environmental medicine. And that's the toxins and chemicals that can impact our health. And my focus has been on climate change. The clinical informatics is how can we leverage technology innovation, which includes people and processes to really improve physician and provider workflows and patient outcomes. Um, I, I have multiple hats. I, I with, in UCSF, I've worked with the uh, climate, the University of California Center for Climate Health and Equity and the Green Health Labs. And I'm also the co-founder of something called CHILL. It's an organization that stands for Climate Health Innovation and Learning Labs. Uh, I'm also a co-founder of a generative clinical AI company called Quench. Um, and really the, the main focus for both of these works are in addressing the, the biggest pain points. And with climate change, it is the uh, vulnerable populations that are most impacted by, by climate change and how we, can, how we can use technology to adapt and mitigate the impacts on their health. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Javelin Castellanos, and I'm here in Dallas, uh, Texas. I was born in Miami, uh, but raised here in Texas, so i um, happy to just be in the Lone Star State. I have a background in molecular biology research, but also in healthcare. So I'm very passionate about health equity, community health, and reaching our communities where they are in order to improve health outcomes. I um, And I defined basically health equity as being able to give our communities equal opportunity to 
be as healthy as possible and dismantling all of the social factors that could exist around reaching that health equity aspect. Um, I, my background, like I said, is in healthcare. So I've worked with two uh, healthcare institutions here in Dallas, Texas, but I'm currently undergoing transition. And right now I'm representing Health Wildcatters, which is um, a capital uh, seed venture and also accelerator uh, company here in Dallas. So happy to be here and I'm very excited for this conversation. Great. Um, yeah, thank you all. I love the experiences that you have and the type of work that you're doing right now. Um, maybe we can jump into, from your perspective, what you've seen in your professional and personal life. What do you think are some of the root causes or factors that contribute to health inequity? And if you feel comfortable maybe sharing a personal story of how you yourself may have been impact, impacted by um, health disparities within the Latino community. I'm happy to start this one off. Um, COVID was a big, big motivation for me. Um, I was actually in my fourth year of medical school at the start of the pandemic. I went to medical school in Vermont, mm -hmm. uh, even though I was born in LA, so it was a huge culture clash. And right at the end of March, um, I remember I was going to sleep and I got a call from my uncle who was a 50 year old construction worker here in LA, had never seen a doctor, just called me out of the blue saying, I think I'm sick. And I remember at that time thinking, okay, well, maybe you have COVID, maybe not. He's like, no, 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 I do have COVID. I was like, okay, this became a little more serious. I was like, have you seen a doctor? And he said, oh no, I think I'll be fine. Because in our culture, we're used to, if we're not dying on the ground, then we're fine. We're, we're strong enough, we're gonna work through it, we're gonna go through it. Um, he ended up not being strong enough and ended up having to be rushed to the ED. And in the span of on week four, he was intubated. And unfortunately, by week six, week six he passed. For my family, that was a traumatic event. And by being the only Latina physician like in my family and the first in my family, I was often the one that was communicating with the care team and trying to organize that. And, and I was wearing multiple hats at the same time. And I don't I bring up this story with a lot of caution because I know a lot of us in this room also have similar stories of losses or know somebody who was affected by COVID. And the thing is, this happened, this was way too common in the Latino and, and Black communities. It was disproportionately too common. And for me, the thing I always look back to is if my uncle had thought of calling a doctor, his doctor at the first signs of the symptoms, he might have still been here. He might have been able to accelerate the whole thing. And recent research has actually shown that a lot of the reasons why Latinos did um, have fatal outcomes was be just because they suck, they sought care just way too late. So for me, that's a huge disadvantage. And that's why right now in my clinic, every patient that I see, I make sure they're connected to the portal. I make sure they can do a video visit because right now they're fine, they're healthy, we might not need to, need to adjust their medications, but what if we have another pandemic? Or what if there's an emergency? My saying is always, it's easier to do it now when people are healthy than when they're sick. So for me, that's always a constant motivation and um, I, I really wanna prevent, give as many families access as possible. I can, um, you know, just continue. And for me, um, I was working at Parkland Health at that point, which was a public health institution here in Dallas, one of the largest ones. Um, and so being, having to go out into the community and seeing the disparities that existed in the comments, you know, a lot of people, I started August, 2020, I think it was, you know, the mm -hmm. vaccine hadn't came out at that point. So it was more about that health communication aspect and understanding what are communities needed? And so there's like, like Dr. Fernandez said, there's that language uh, disparity, you know, that language barrier. Um, there's that uh, healthcare access and some are the rates of uninsured across the nation for Latino communities are just seven. I, I think it was, I saw a study, it was 17% and it continues to increase. So not only the language barrier, but also the uninsured and the fear that comes with seeking help um, collectively, we saw our communities being impacted the most when it came to COVID. And so when we think about um, 
the comments and you know a lot of a lot of communities like the Latino communities were receiving a vaccine the flu vaccine for the very first time ever um, so not only did we see our communities coming out to to seek care but also being engaged with health and that aspect of wanting to know how to take care of their families was really important mm -hmm. we conducted um, focus groups after the pandemic kind of got better or, you know, not got better, but um, the cases were decreasing, we did focus groups. And I wrote some of these comments because they still stick, they still have been with me throughout this time. And it was like, I want to be heard, but I just keep getting referred to, you know, there needs to be diverse representation from the moment they step into the office to the actual provider. And then another comment that said, our comunidades need to understand that they have the power to take charge of their health and ask questions to a doctor. Mm -hmm. So all of these aspects of healthcare from provider representation to language barriers, to access to, the, to care are um, just some of those roots of health inequities that exist. So, um, and I'll kick it over to Dr. Leitner to, to continue. Thanks so much. Yeah, I really resonate with what everyone's said here. Uh, my, my personal experience really provided also a lot of valuable insights in the health disparities. Um, again, in I'm from Miami, and in 2017, my family lost their home to Hurricane Irma. They live in a lowland area, and after the storm, uh, we had to find our baby pictures and Christmas ornaments in the mangroves. It was, it was really hard for us. And the struggle was shared across South Florida and showcased the, an exacerbation of health inequities from climate change among Latina communities um, with access to basic resources, things as simple and as substantial as water and food and education on what to do next. And then also a couple, a couple years later, um, when I moved to San Francisco, it was July of 2020. So still very new within COVID and figuring out what to do. And I was volunteering with the UCSF Latinx Center for Excellence on COVID education and really mostly myth busting and trying to act as the translator for our mostly English speaking uh, physicians to the Spanish population. Um, and this is around the time that the orange sky happened. It was a natural phenomenon where the air pollution was so bad from the wildfires that the sky literally turned orange. Um, and the Latina community that I was volunteering with were directly impacted by this. They did not have the appropriate education or masks or access to clean air. And witnessing these disparities firsthand really motivates my work to work towards solutions that address these critical issues because ultimately the disparity there is the quality to uh, healthcare access to education and these are not just social determinants of health that impact them but it's also the environmental determinants of health that we want to focus in on too yeah yeah thank you all for sharing those perspectives and experiences you know definitely a theme that i heard was like healthcare maybe wasn't designed for latinos in mind right like there's a lot of gaps in accessing high quality care that is linguistically and culturally relevant and competent. And even when they do have access to some healthcare, we forget to account for other factors like environmental um, determinants of health as well. And, and one thing that I'll add to the mix too as, as some of the root causes of health inequities is just the structural barriers that we see, right? Like structural racism, discrimination um, that we also see that our communities experience. Um, thank you all. And so with the theme of pandemics and, and sort of how COVID impacted many communities, you know, I'm curious to you all, um, how can we potentially leverage the power of technology and innovation to address health disparities before another huge emergency takes place? Uh, maybe we'll go the other way this time, Dr. Leitner, and, and we'll be back that way. Sure, thank you. So I think that uh, digital innovation has immense potential to reduce healthcare inequities, but I wanna make a focus on what the word innovation means to me as a clinical informatician, you know, innovation is not just tech it's also people innovation of thought innovation of processes and workflow but then of course innovation of technology really that can act independently or as a common denominator for all of these ways that we try to improve the lives around us um, focusing in on tech which i think is like the theme of, of so much of this is by leveraging the technology we can develop targeted solutions for the underserved communities and with my focus on climate change one example is uh, using predictive models that incorporate environmental data. So this is things like weather forecasting data that can link with public health systems that have information on patients, such as where they are uh, location-wise near air, air pollution issue, uh, more air polluted areas, such as close to, 
Sorry, I just heard, I think a bird hit the window. Um, air pollution areas that are closer to highways or closer to bus stops. Um, how can we identify those individuals before weather events happen? For example, if there's wildfires happening, we know three to seven days in advance of the direction that the wind is blowing of who's going to be uh, impacted most. So we can identify those individuals. We can provide them with timely care and education to avoid them from even ac needing to access the healthcare system in the first place. But to do that, we really need the language accessible and culturally sensitive technologies that should be built by individuals from this community to bridge the communication gaps and ensure that the information reaches the appropriate uh, communities. Also, uh, other initiatives like outside of the tech really are for the people and the processes. And so if we promote things like education around digital literacy and the diversity in the health tech sector that opens opportunities for Latinx and BIPOC communities, that can really help uh, shape the healthcare innovations. And so I think it's mostly about democratizing the access to healthcare resources and services. Uh, the digital innovation can contribute significantly to the healthcare inequities. Thank you. Um, yeah, so following up with that, kind of on the same, echoing what Dr. Leitner said on the power of digital health literacy and leveraging um, mobile devices, right, through mHealth apps, through mobile um, health innovation. And so a study by Nielsen actually showed that 98% of U.S. Latino populations owned a smartphone. So when you think about leveraging the smartphone towards telehealth, potentially. I know Dr. Fernandez has so much insight on that. So um, also, you know, the, the power that there can exist to create culturally competent health applications that allow communities to learn about how to take care of their health, but also engage them in creative ways that allows them to change those behaviors, you know, whether it's teaching them how to culturally uh, cook, right? Um, diabetes is one of the uh, chronic diseases diseases that exist in our community. So how can we leverage those digital health devices to, to really um, target our communities in a creative, innovative, uh, in a creative, innovative way? So um, I'll hand it over to Dr. Fernandez. Yes, I just want to take a moment to pause and really kind of reflect on what our conversation has been this far. It seems like we're, none of us are talking about health in a clinic. We're all talking about different things that impact our health. And I think that's so interesting because a lot of the times when I have, when I see a new patient, the first question I ask is, how are you feeling? And a lot of the times they say fine. And I was like, okay. And for them, that might be the only time they think about their health. Not knowing that majority of Latinos in our country live with three chronic diseases. So they're walking around unhealthy. They're walking around unfine. But why is it that we're so used to that, that we think that that's fine, right? So. What I really think is as we're trying to bring in these different components of what contributes to health, we really need to define to the Latinx community what wellness is, right? We, we throw around the word wellness because, you know, I, I recently I listened to a podcast that says like Latinos can't even afford to be healthy. How can you afford to be well, right? Mm -hmm. What is that? What does wellness look like? Is that just going to yoga classes? Is that getting facials? Like, what does that look like? And um, redefining this idea that we don't just have health one day when you see a doctor, you live with your health throughout the entirety of your life. Um, I think, and I, I talk to my patients about that a lot because I really challenge them to think about it because once you start thinking that you're addressing your life, your health every single day, we, whether you're with a doctor or you're not, you start noticing gaps. Like, oh, wow, maybe there is too much dust in my home. Oh, wow, maybe I shouldn't be eating this, this fast food because this affects my health. So really changing this paradigm. And that's something that I'm working with our medical students here about so that we can start training the next generation of physicians to start thinking this way. Uh, and I'm not sure if anybody knows, but October 1st was actually the second annual National Latino Physician Day. Latinos are only compensate only 6%. Latino physicians are only 6% of all Latinos in the country and Latinas uh, are 2.5%. So we're definitely celebrating that. We wanna get more people in the field yeah, thank you. This is a great point, you know, and I come from a, a mental health background trained as a psychologist and now doing research in digital health um, applications or um, promoting culturally competent care for Latino patients and other underserved communities. And there's also just a lot of history, right, in, in terms of how communities have been marginalized and what that does for stigma for seeking healthcare, seeking services, and how they 
uh, come to understand your own health and what that means. So, so great discussion. Uh, we're coming up on time. We have 10 minutes and a couple more questions. I know it's moving by really, really fast. And I think that's because of the great discussion, we can do a whole conference center around this. So I'll be looking out to you all for planning purposes. But um, maybe I want to open it up to the audience and, and see if there's a couple of questions that would come um, that folks have been sitting on that you want to uh, articulate and ask us. And while you do that, maybe just really quickly, we can go around and answer this last question that I have for you all. Um, how do you think that health tech can help promote better opportunities, you know, in health or health access or health information, health education among Latinx and BIPOC, BIPOC communities? So what can what role can health technology play there to promote better opportunities for Latinx and BIPOCs? And if the audience has questions, feel free to send them through the Q&A or put them in the chat. Um, I can start off. Um, I think that when we think about from a generational perspective and also that um, early education for students, for future students initially, how can we continue to promote STEM and tech opportunity awareness for, for, for elementary school, middle school, and providing that early access to what it means to be in a tech career, right? So either it means, you know, tech companies going out to schools and talking about their work, um, of, you know, the rate of Latinos in tech is, is fairly small. And so how can we increase that rate by showing that representation um, early on and inspiring students to, to go into these tech fields and bring that um, experience with them to create innovations in the tech space. Um, another, from the other aspect of how can their opportunities be created, I think um, really keeping our communities in mind. You know, when we think about digital health equity, sometimes these innovations are not keeping our communities in mind, you know, from translation to being able to use a specific wearable. Um, so how can we make it as easy as accessible and also keeping the patient, um, in this case, our Latino communities in mind when creating that health tech innovation wearable or creative innovative approach that's culturally competent. So um, I'll leave that and I'll hand it over to Dr. Fernandez or Dr. Leitner. Sure, thank you so much. Yeah, I think that health tech can do better by actively addressing barriers of um, education and especially among physicians. I remember that when I was a medical student, um, there's just so much to learn. It really is uh, when they describe a water hose, sometimes it feels like there's double water hoses. And to understand, to, to learn from the perspective of cultural sensitivity in a way that addresses uh, opportunities for others you know, is, is a challenge. And I think it really starts from the top down and then it, it becomes a cycle. And so things that are being done, like Dr. Fernandez is educating the medical students. Um, these are the things that I was given access to, but it also starts within pre-med as well. Um, I was part of the minority association of pre-medical students at Florida State University, and um, which is part of the SNMA and LMSA. And these are pipeline programs that really start with conversations and, and just pure education. And as we continue to go on, you know, there's a, there's a whole aspect of physicians and providers that aren't aware of a lot of these problems and, and just simple education that can then impact patient care and sort of like a branching approach. When we start from where the patients actually are coming in or the community leaders that they trust the most, how can that then impact uh, the way they think and, and how they access health tech? And I think that allows for um, even understanding that people who look like them and that come from backgrounds like them are able to accomplish you know, really great things to give back to the community. And so it's kind of community engagement, education, and, and focusing in on what could be some of the most impactful areas for us to focus in on to then get the most return on that investment of focusing our time and resources. Yes, I just want to echo what everyone said. And it starts with, you know, having these conferences, like go home and tell your kids or tell anyone. I met like two doctors who work in tech, like we never thought about it, right? <laughs> I know when I told my parents, they were like, oh, vas a practicar como doctora, yeah? And I'm like, uh, maybe. <laughs> I have all these projects lined up as well. So mm -hmm. we really are redefining what healthcare looks like. And it's so, it really is exciting because I went to a conference recently that said, maybe we don't need to change the existing healthcare system. Maybe we just need to create a new one. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Um, I, wish, I, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, yeah, that's really, really powerful. So it looks like a, a few questions have come in and so I'll just take uh, a few of them 
in the interest of time, and I'll just ask each one of you directly to maybe respond to them, if that's okay. Um, so I'll start from some that came through the Q&A, and I'll sort of combine them into one. But um, Dr. Fernandez, are there any um, issues within the MD or DO pipeline that disproportionately affect Latinos more than other BIPOC, BIPOC communities? And what do you think about uh, interventions to educate younger generations to help parents with nutritional knowledge and information. Okay. So pipelines that affect the uh, BIPOC communities and uh, nutrition information interventions for younger generations. So the younger generation is really key. So as a family med doctor, I see everyone, right? From babies to like geriatric patients. Um, at Harvard UCLA, we have a summer urban health fellowship that is a pipeline program for underserved um, communities, people that are interested in pre-health. The biggest, the number one question these students have is, can I really do it? It's having the confidence to go into this field. So mm -hmm. the reason why my program puts so much emphasis on mentorship is because we think representation is a public health issue. They pay us our regular physician salary to go and mentor these students because that is an investment in the community, that's an investment in the health of our community. It's the same thing, it equals the same thing. So us being there with these students and that's them, yes, you know, a lot of the students, we're the first Latino doctors that they've met. Like for me, I didn't meet my first Latina doctor until I was 15, 16. And it was the first time that I could really see myself in those shoes. So having a representation like this, um, the, the way I do it is by do, I have a, a TikTok, I have an Instagram following, I meet people, students where they are. You know, I try, to, I try to mentor as much as I can, and I really try to share my experience as a doctor in tech, as a Latina doctor in tech. What does that look like? What challenges do I have? So that they can come in here too. Like this weekend, I'm going to the Healthcare, Healthcare Foundation um, annual conference in Las Vegas. It's a four day conference. Each ticket is at least 15 to $2,000. There's no students that are going, but I'm gonna bring them all with me on Instagram. <laughs> no one can stop me from doing that. So, um, I mean, if you guys are welcome to join too. So I would love everybody to come and support through Instagram stories and then through TikTok, right? Because though that's where that's where people are and through Facebook, I should do Facebook as well, actually. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, Ms. Castellanos, one question that came in was, some of the advanced funding that goes towards advancing technology or disrupting healthcare, um, it's often at the hands of people that don't represent BIPOC or Latina communities. Uh, how do you recommend moving into some of these boards, maybe this, joining these meetings, being part of the decision-making table? Thank you, that's a great question. And when we think about you know health equity and how we can continue to move the needle towards um, improving representation across boards, I think it's really about engaging in the conversation, right? Being able to find opportunities where you can connect with individuals who are in that space and being able to say, you know, these are my interests and this is what I'm doing. And so I think it's like Dr. Fernandez said earlier, this is one of the ways that we can start moving the needle towards that direction. Um, another one is I know Dallas recently got like the ARPA H award, which is going to, you know, improve the way that biotech is being and the innovations are being represented and our Latino communities will be represented through the studies and being able to reach out to our communities in unique ways. So being able to support, engage in these types of roles when those opportunities come about, I think it's an important way, but I definitely think it's being able to be educated about these topics, um, engage with these conversations, and also um, finding ways to connect with people who are in those boardrooms to um, to start moving the needle. And you know, for them to ask, uh, you know, say your name in, in rooms that you're not in to start engaging in these conversations. Yeah, great point. And one of that those ways is continue to connect with the folks, the panelists here today to continue having some of these conversations and get opportunities for that. So to close us out, um, because we're running out of time, Dr. Leitner, maybe you can give us some um, advice or names of organizations and ways to get involved that um, deal with the intersection of climate and health. Oh, absolutely. So it's a really fascinating time where climate and health are actually being um, focused in on. You know, it, it it's almost counterintuitive for some people to think about how the climate can impact their health until they think of how wildfire smoke can cause asthma exacerbations, diabetes issues, um, heat waves can cause problems for anyone on hypertension medications, um, flooding can cause disease exacerbation for infectious diseases. So one of the incredible things that just happened is the Office for Climate Health 
and equity uh, with the, the U.S. Department of Health. HHS just started that. And um, so it's a, a really great resource that I think that they're plugging in a lot of funding, education opportunities, and scholarships to explore it more and really focus in on addressing marginalized communities like Latinx and uh, BIPOC communities. So I really think that that one is Ochi. I'll put it in the chat really quick um, so that anyone can access that. That's probably the, the main biggest one right now. Yeah, well, thank you all. Uh, virtual round of applause for coming here today, doing the great work that y'all are doing. And for everyone in the audience, please keep this conversation going. Connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, and I hope you got something out of this. So thank you all. Thank you so much. I hope thank you connect you. with everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.